Welcome everyone. My name is Emmanuel Kokum. I'm here with my colleague, Patish Mutukmar, and we are gonna be presenting real-time spatial temporal air pollution prediction with deep convolutional LSTM through satellite image analysis. I wanted to begin our presentation by providing you all a little bit of context about our work. Air pollution, as I'm sure you are all aware, is a global problem. In fact, in as recent as 2017, it was reported to have been responsible for 5 million deaths. To put that into perspective, that was nearly one in 10 of all deaths across the globe. Now for our work, the air pollutant that we were interested in was nitrogen dioxide. And some of the more specific adverse health effects of NO2 include difficulty breathing, increased risk of asthma, and increased risk of respiratory diseases. Los Angeles, which is the geographic area of our interest, was reported to have had 25 million metric tons of NO2. And to put that into perspective, that made Los Angeles the city with the highest level of nitrogen dioxide in the US. In the past, deep learning has been used to forecast NO2. Some of the more traditional approaches include using convolutional neural networks, which were great at finding spatial correlations in data, and LSTMs, which were really good at finding temporal correlations in data. Now, some of the limitations with the previous work is that they treated NO2 as data that was either spatially related or temporally related. However, NO2 has both spatial and temporal correlation. We can understand this intuitively, spatially, if we remember that NO2 is an air pollutant and therefore travels through the air. And so the NO2 in any one area is very likely to travel to its surrounding area. And temporally, if we look at the NO2 levels right now and one hour ago and two or two hours ago, we can see that they're very much related. Our goals were to forecast NO2 in Los Angeles County over a period of time. However, unlike the previous works, we wanted to utilize both the spatial and temporal correlations in our data. Hence why we decided to implement a Conv LSTM. The Conv LSTM is a modification of the fully connected LSTM. And like the fully connected LSTM, it is able to utilize one sequence to reproduce another. Unlike the fully connected LSTM, the Conv LSTM will use convolution rather than matrix multiplication within the LSTM cell. And what that means is that we can process data in a higher dimension. The significance of that is that we're able to not only find temporal correlation, but now spatial correlations in our data as well. So in order to use a highly complex model like the Convalis TM structure, we need to carefully choose data that allows us to implement both the spatial and temporal correlations that we fit our problem around. The data that we've chosen is image-based and also along a sequence that's spaced over time. We chose the European Space Agency's Sentinel-2 satellite imagery. The satellite has a 13-band spectral imaging instrument on board, but for the purpose of this research, we are focused on two of the bands, one of them being the nitrogen dioxide imaged in light blue, shown in the right figure, and the other being the general particulate matter imaged in a white cloud-like structure. Beneath the imaging are the land cover and the ocean of the geographic area. The range of the data is from March 2015, when the Sentinel-2 satellite was launched, to March 2020, so five years of data. Each of the frames are spaced by exactly 46 hours, or around two days. And the location of the images are a 100 kilometer squared area of northwest LA County, so 10 kilometers on each side covering most of Los Angeles County and some of the uh, Pacific Ocean and a little bit of Catalina Island. It's in the GeoTIFF file format, which is a very high resolution format, much higher than a JPEG or a PNG format. So we'll really be able to see the imaging over specific areas in Los Angeles County over time. 
It's very high resolution at 5,400 pixels by 5,400 pixels. So for example, uh, image is shown on the right as an NO2 and general particulate matter imaging of LA County on August 18th of 2018. So in total, we have over a thousand different images ranging for five years, which each image being two days apart. So now that we have collected all the raw satellite images, we can now move on to pre-processing the input data. And we are pre-processing for two reasons. The first reason is that we want to isolate only the NO2, the nitrogen dioxide imaging that we've seen in the ESA Sentinel-2 satellite imagery as we're not as concerned with the white cloud-like structures and the uh, general land cover and the ocean beneath it, but we're more focused on this light blue imaging of nitrogen dioxide over Los Angeles County. And so the other reason why we're implementing pre-processing is because we're going to create four different iterations of our data set that all have slightly different features. And uh, with these four iterations, we're gonna test on different model hyperparameters and then you'll be able to see which hyperparameters perform best uh, with the Convil STM model. So the specifics on the pre-processing is that we're gonna be using a filtering mask, two, two different types. One of them is an RGB filtering mask, a red, green, blue filtering mask that implements in three channels. So in the hue range of 0, 60, 60 to 225, 255, 255, or essentially the light blue color spectrum, which is the nitrogen dioxide imaging, we're gonna set that to the original RGB color. While all other general particulate matter, the land cover and the ocean are set to a 000 RGB color or black. And the binary filtering mask is a similar idea where we're going to set the light blue NO2 to uh, one specific category, which in this case is gonna be set to one and the, all others set to zero. So in this case, we have only one filter because we are doing it in a binary version. And then we're also going to use a very resolution pre-processing where we're going to be focusing on a high resolution test, which is a 400 pixel by 400 pixel JPEG, and a low resolution test, which is a 40 pixel by 40 pixel JPEG. And the reason why we're doing these very resolutions is that we can test out the different accuracies and speeds of our model. So with the two combinations of filtering masks, uh, the RGB filtering and the binary filtering, and the two combinations of the varied resolutions, the high resolution and the low resolution, we have four total iterations of our data set that we can now tweak our hyperparameters around and see which ones perform the best given iterations of our data set. After we had pre-processed the raw satellite data, we had to reshape the data in order to fit with the convalescent TM structure. The interesting part about the convalescent TM structure is that now we had to figure out how to make the input data conform with the traditional LSTM structure, but also conform with the traditional convolutional neural network structure. So to do that, we had to first figure out what our goal was. And we decided that we wanted to predict 10 days in the future, given 10 days in the past. And since each of the frames are 46 hours apart, or roughly two days, we're using five frames in the past to predict five frames in the future. Using that mindset, we bundled five frames into a sample having consecutive frames, meaning, for example, sample one, would have frames one, two, three, four, five, corresponding to 10 days of data. And so our total data set dimension, we'd have four versions of these data sets. We're showing right here the two different resolutions on the RGB mask filtering, where we'd have 225 different samples. Each sample has five frames, and either it's a 40 by 40 for the low resolution or 400 by 400 for the high resolution test, and three filters for the red, green, and blue. Alternatively, if, if it was a binary filter, then we'd use a uh, 225, 5, 40, 41, or 225, 5, 400, 401. And in order to figure out how we're gonna set up the label corresponding to the input features, we decided that the label would be the prediction uh, 10 days in the future. And to do that, we lagged the input features by five frames from the label. And so for example, now if we're training on our input frames one through five, with our label being six through 10, then we're predicting for six through 10 and we can test our model against some accuracy metric on the label six through 10. And then we're staggering our input so that we have a sliding window where the next one would be an input frames of two through six to predict frames seven through 11 and we can apply our metric with the label seven through 11, so on and so forth. And so we split up our test set and training set into having our training set being 75% of the data 
and our test set being 25% of the data. And the image below shows the training set where we have the samples one through 168, where they're a sliding window off by each one, but we're using five frames in the past to always predict five frames in the future. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about the specifics of the model, especially the input and output dimensionality. So as shown in the previous slide, we used a five dimensional input uh, where we used a data set that had the inputs being samples, frames, rows, columns, and filters. And we used a five dimensional input because on top of it being helpful for our predicting 10 days in the future using 10 days in the past, uh, it's also the required dimensionality for the Keras Convol STM layers that we will be implementing. And we'll be using a five dimensional tensor, which will be both the input and output dimensions. And so the output dimension is the samples, frames, rows, columns, and filters, similarly to the pre-processed satellite input data from the five-dimensional input. And the output is a predicted image of nitrogen dioxide in Los Angeles County over time. For our uh, Convol STM structure, we implemented various KRS layers, and we built a sequential encoder-decoder Convol STM structure, with the first layer being a Convol STM 2D layer, uh, one filter and a two by two kernel size, same padding throughout the entire model. We sandwiched them with batch normalization layers. Uh, the second Convol STM layer was a similarly a one filter, but three by three kernel size. And finally, our Convol STM 3D layer is a three filter, three by three by three kernel size using a ReLU activation for the RGB color filters, but a sigmoid activation for the binary colors because we could use sigmoid for a zero to one output. And we have the same padding throughout for the Convol STM 3D as well. We use the NATOM optimizer with the 25 epochs running for batch size of 10 and a validation split of 0.1. So now it came time to evaluate our model. And the issue with having our output being an image-based output over time is that our traditional methods using RMSC, MSC, and MAE are not as effective because any minor differences in the pixels, since all of these images can be reflected back down to pixels and values, any minor differences in pixels, specifically maybe the hue is off by a few certain values, would reflect a very large error in the traditional methods. So it, this uh, traditional RMSC, MSC, and MAE are not the most optimal metrics for this application. And even though that we might see similar tests and prediction images, this is not gonna be reflected in the traditional methods. So instead, we decided to use another metric titled SSIM, or the Structural Similarity Index me Metric. The SSIM is essentially, it's quantifying the human perceived similarities and the general trends if, say, a, a human were to look at the two images of the test and prediction side by side, how visually similar do they look on a zero to one scale, with a zero meaning that the images are completely dissimilar and an SSIM of one meaning that they're completely and exactly identical. However, the SSIM is not completely su uh, subjective. It is based on also the pixel values, so it is an empirical measurement, but instead of reflecting the minute differences that might be seen in pixels that would reflect a large error for RMSC and the traditional methods, SSIM implements the uses of the mean and the standard deviation in order to normalize the metric so that the pixel values, even though there might be small changes, would not be reflected too drastically in the SSIM metric. So now I'd like to display some of our results that we got from running the Convolus TM model. And in the top right, we can see the SSIM or the structural similarity index metric of the first five frames of the first sample or the first 10 days of prediction given the previous 10 days or five frames. And what we can tell from this is that the earlier predictions were more accurate than the later predictions as shown by the SSIM values in frame one being the highest and gradually decaying as we go down the frames. And this is likely because when we're predicting for frame one, which is two days in the future of Los Angeles County NO2 values, this is likely highly correlated to the previous five frames that it's used for the training data rather than frame five, which is trying to predict 10 days in the future, where the very first training data was 10 days in the past. So essentially the distance between the very first frame in the training set and the frame five prediction is 20 days. And so likely the NO2 values between that time are less correlated than what it would be in frame one. In the bottom right corner, we can see the RGB mask filtering of the predictions. On the left column, we can see the predictions, and on the right column is the ground truth, or the labels. 
and uh, the top row is the very first frame or the second day in the future NO2 prediction. And the bottom row is the second frame or fourth day in the future NO2 prediction. And similarly, we can see that earlier predictions are more accurate than later predictions visually. And the other thing is that the predictions were smoother than the, than the test labels. This is likely because the filter mask used in pre-processing when it was used in the input data and the test labels was likely too rigid when it was removing the NO2 and resulted in a grainier image than desired. So there are many directions that we'd want to move our research in in the future. But one main area is using our already developed Convil STM model using the input satellite imagery and adding into it the meteorological data features. These data features include relative humidity, wind pressure, air speed, temperature, various meteorological features that can give us a better picture of nitrogen dioxide in a spatiotemporal format than what could just be found through a satellite image on a geostationary satellite. The other direction that we want to move into is combining the satellite image inputs and the ground sensor data. The reason why we want to do this is because ground sensor data of nitrogen dioxide or PM 2.5 or PM 10 or various air pollutant matters is that the ground sensor data would more accurately show the exact values for a given time in a given place than what we'd see from an image-based satellite value of a NO2 or PM 2.5 or any air pollutant. And so we want to include the correlations of the meteorological data with our ground sensor data and our satellite images into a more complex model that implements the specifics of what we can find in ground sensor data, but also the visual aids that we can see in satellite images, and also the underlying features that we can see in meteorological data that is not shown in just the satellite images or the ground sensor data. And we'd also want to predict the exact NO2 values in parts per million or parts per billion. Uh, similarly to how we get the inputs of the ground sensor data, we'd like to be able to say that for a specific place and a specific time, like in Los Angeles County, at some certain date, we can say the exact value of NO2 predicting, say, 10 days in the future given 10 days in the past or in some similar derivative. Finally, we'd like to thank all of our co-authors and our collaborators, including Dr. Mohamed Pouramayoun, the City of Los Angeles, and OpenAQ. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact us via email. Once again, thank you for taking the time to listen to our presentation, and we hope you have a great rest of your day.